Okay, Genesis 1, verse 1, the first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then after that cannon blast of an introduction, uh, God's unfolding of creation is described. And on the sixth day of creation, God said, let us make man in our image, and in the image of God, he created them, the Genesis account says, male and female, he created them. So God implanted, deposited his image onto humanity. He made us special as the pinnacle of his created order. And what he did is he placed the man and the woman in a paradise called Eden. It was a massive garden that they were then meant to cultivate the material that God had given them that they were to spend their lifetimes cultivating before God while also simultaneously enjoying God, partaking of God, fellowshipping with God, befriending God, experiencing God. The Garden of Eden was a place that Adam and Eve would live, but it was also a place where God would dwell. Now, of course, you know the story that sin soon entered into our species, and so the garden atmosphere was in so many ways destroyed. The friendship and closeness and connectivity that God had with man was destroyed. The man and woman began to war against each other, and even the ground itself turned against humanity and became difficult to cultivate, difficult to earn a living. By the sweat of your brow, God said, you will eat bread. And really, in a sense, I think that you could say that almost everything that we've done up until that point has been some attempt at trying to get back what was lost there in the garden. God had created a beautiful home, yet sin had destroyed that home. In fact, some theologians wonder if everything that we build today is done with an echo of that Garden of Eden experience. Every stadium or structure or cathedral or home or magnolia market-inspired living room is constructed in an attempt to recapture some of the essence that was lost in the home that God originally designed us for. But we lost it due to sin. Now, years later, God rescued a small little nation of people, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt. And he called their leader, a man named Moses, to the mountaintop, where he gave Moses directions for the nation. And one of the things that God gave to Moses were the plans for a tabernacle that would eventually one day mature into a temple. It would be the place where God would dwell. They would have priests who would come and officiate and represent the nation before God, but God would be, his presence would be in that tabernacle, the glory of the Lord experienced there in that tabernacle, and God wanted them to place the tabernacle at the center of their encampment. It was, if you will, a second garden of Eden. It was a second statement from God that I want to live among you. I want to be at the center of who you are, and I want you to have fellowship with me. Now, it looked very different than the Garden of Eden. Don't get me wrong. Sin had done a number on humanity, so it took sacrifices. It took a priesthood that was ordained with various garments on their bodies. It took certain festivals and days of the year, but nonetheless, God wanted to be known. He wanted to make his home among his people. But again, like in the Garden of Eden, sin destroyed that temple as well. The Israelites were eventually banished from the land because of their sin. They did return and tried to rebuild the temple, but God's glory never came back to their rebuilt structure until one day when a little baby who was eight days old named Jesus was brought into the temple precincts by his mother Mary. And an old prophet named Simeon said, Behold, now my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. And John, the apostle, looking back at that event, he says in John chapter 1, verse 14, that in that event, when Jesus came, he said that God 
himself became flesh in that moment and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means he tabernacled among us. He made his home among us. And Peter tells us in this passage that that Jesus was then rejected by men, forsaken by men, declined by humanity. And what he then did was rise from the grave and start a brand new house, a brand new structure. He's the living stone, Peter said in verse four. He's the cornerstone, Peter said in verse six of this new structure, this new living spiritual house that God has built. So that now on this side of the cross, where does God dwell? Not in the Garden of Eden, not in the tabernacle, not in the temple, but God dwells in his people, among his people. We physically are the house of the Lord, the house of God. I'm actually very happy that we're in this particular passage on this very Sunday. You know, today's a special day for a lot of reasons. It's Sunday, it's the Lord's Day, it's Father's Day. But today at 9.30, we got to move a little bit further to having full indoor services. And we had a great time at the 9.30 service. We had a great time at the 8 o'clock service right here in Sanctuary 2. But one of the things I rejoice over is that here we are gathering together in a building we haven't gathered in for a very long time, yet we all understand from this passage that the building is not the church. The building is not God's house. We are God's house is what this passage is teaching us. And so we praise the Lord for that reality. A handful of people want to clap for that. So what this tells us is that as believers, God has made a home for us. We are his home. We are accepted by him. And today I want to talk to you about the three things that Peter points out in this passage. He tells us that we're God's people, he tells us that we're God's house, and he tells us that we're God's priesthood. That's who we are. And each one of these things is so helpful and important when you're living an exilic Christian life, to know that you belong to God, to know that you are his dwelling place, and to know that you have a job to do here on earth. So let's think about the first thing. Number one, we are God's people. We are God's people. This whole letter, Peter, Peter has been telling us who we are. He's been telling us that we're redeemed, that we're chosen, that we're uh, exiles, that we're born again, uh, that we've tasted that the Lord is good. But now he tells us here in verse five that we are living stones in God's house. Okay, That's who you are. If you're a Christian today, if you believe in Jesus, you are a living stone in God's house. Now, the reason that you are a living stone in God's house, according to Peter, is that Jesus was the first living stone. And this follows New Testament theology. Jesus' experience and status is our experience and status. So Jesus died, and by faith, you also died to sin and to death and all that stuff that the curse brought. Jesus was buried, and you also were buried with him against all that stuff. And Jesus rose from the dead, so you also live now in resurrection power and life, and one day we'll experience the great and final resurrection of all things that Jesus will bring when he returns. So Jesus' status and experience is your status and experience. That's why Peter can say, Jesus is the living stone, and we are are living stones. We received our life from who Jesus is. Now, what is Jesus' experience in the verses that we read today? Well, look at verse 4. Jesus was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. He was rejected by men. Now, think about how comforting that would be if you were living in the first century and you'd begun to hear threats because of your Christianity You'd begun to receive slander because of your Christianity. You'd begun to maybe miss out on career opportunities because of your Christianity. And you might begin wondering if there's something that you should do, if something, there's something wrong with who you are. And now here comes Peter, 
announcing to us that Jesus, he also was rejected by men. In fact, he was first before you and me could be rejected. He was rejected by men. Now think about who Jesus is. Jesus is the nicest person who ever lived. Jesus is the most righteous person who ever lived. You can't be better than Jesus. You can't be kinder than Jesus. And so if these believers were sitting there wondering, is there something we can do to become better, kinder, more acceptable to society, they could look in the face of their own Lord and say, if even Jesus was rejected, then we might expect the rejection would come in and for his name. Now, later in the letter, Peter is going to tell these people, he's going to say, hey, if you are experiencing suffering because you've been a knucklehead, this is my translation, if you're experiencing that, then you need to deal with your knuckleheadedness. But that's not the point that he's making here. Right here, what he's saying is, if you're in Christ, your experience is going to be like Jesus' experience. And if Jesus suffered and was rejected by mankind, then don't you think that there will be times as a Christian that you are rejected by humanity as well? But Peter is not satisfied with trying to just comfort us with that truth. I mean, can you imagine if that's how we left here today? Like, okay, hey, everybody, you're feeling a little marginalized for your Christianity. You hop on Facebook and you see people saying nasty things about Jesus and nasty things about Christians and you feel bad. And Peter's big comfort is, hey, don't worry, Jesus also was rejected. It's all good. We kind of walk out of here going, well, that's like partially helpful. But Peter has the other side of the truth. He says, Jesus was rejected by men in verse four, but notice what else he says. He says, he was chosen by God and precious. These are not Peter's words. He read them in Isaiah 28, which he quoted in verse six. And in Isaiah 28, God said, I'm gonna lay in Zion, in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus died. I'm gonna lay there a cornerstone that is chosen and precious in my sight. And it's so clear that the father loves the son. From eternity past, the Father loved the Son. But when Jesus came, the Father couldn't contain himself. Remember when Jesus was baptized? He comes out of the water, the Spirit descends like a dove, and the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus goes around doing miracles and preaching, and the Father affirms Jesus' words with the supernatural realm and element. Jesus goes to the mountaintop for a time of prayer with Peter and James and John and Moses and Elijah show up from glory. And Peter's all excited. Lord, we should make tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And the father can't contain himself. He's like, I got to let this guy know that Jesus is way better than Moses and Elijah. So he breaks in. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Over and over again, the father confirming his love for the son ultimately by raising him from the dead and then receiving him at his ascension. Jesus is perfect and pure righteousness received by God. He made it to heaven, so to speak, by his own works, by his own goodness, like none of us ever could. Accepted, chosen, precious by the Father. And what Peter wants his audience to know, what he wants us to know, is that if we are in Christ today, we also... Though we might experience the rejection of humanity, we are chosen and precious in the sight of God. Sometimes believers will say that God is very accepting. I don't know if you've ever given that as a compliment towards another human being. You know, I really like this person. Why do you like them so much? Well, they're just so accepting. They're so accepting. And usually what we mean by that is, you know, they just kind of like come as you are, you know, they, they're not judging, you know, and all of that. But if you really think about what it means to be accepting, I don't know that that's really the correct title or description to place upon God. Because with God, there's holiness and righteousness attached to who he is. So what you'd have to really say is, God is accepting as long as you're completely and totally perfect and flawless in his sight. I doubt that any of us would describe that as just accepting. What the Father is, is not accepting of us as we are. The Father looks at us and says, 
Your unrighteousness, though, as filthy rags, it might keep you from me, but my heart wants to get to you. So what will I do to make a way for me to be unleashed upon you? I will send my son so that if you believe in him, you receive his position. And I can accept his position. And so if you trust him, I accept you because you now have his position. So we are chosen and we are precious in God's sight, brothers and sisters, not because we've perfected our Christianity, but because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? All his work and none of ours. But the second thing I want you to see is that we are not only God's people, but we're God's house. Notice that Peter says in verse 5 that we're like living stones being built up into a spiritual house. Uh, Jesus is the first stone, he's the living stone, and then you and I, we're stones that are put into this structure, this house that God lives in. Jesus is the cornerstone, that means he's foundational, he goes in first, but the cornerstone was also used to accurately straighten up every other part of that structure, and so he is our guide, he's the one that we look to. And as stones together, we form a spiritual house for God to live in, for God to dwell in. Uh, Peter said it, or excuse me, Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He said, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you, if you're a Christian today, you're carrying the Holy Spirit around inside of you. You're the temple. You're the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Colossians 1, verse 27, that the great mystery that's now been revealed with Jesus is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So he's actually living within his people. Now, like I've been telling you today, throughout biblical history, God had a house. Garden of Eden, the tabernacle, the temple. But now today, the church is his house. We are the home that God abides in. What is this truth meant to do to exile Christians? Well, one of the implications of being the house of of God is that it helps us understand that we have already been brought home by the Lord if we believe in him. And this is important when you're ostracized for your faith. Because a lot of times when Christians begin to feel that they are being rejected or marginalized for their faith, they begin grasping and searching. And unfortunately, many will then compromise their faith. I've been telling you week after week, that the wrong response is to angrily fight or to flee from society, to sequester and form our own little groups that never interact with the unbelieving world, or to conform to our views, to the society and culture. But a lot of believers, when they don't understand that God has brought them home and that God has made his home among them, uh, and they're God's people What they will then do is they'll try to figure out ways to conform themselves to society so that society can become their home. But when you're confident that God has made you something unique, it just helps you stand a little bit stronger towards the waves that are coming against you. I think another implication of the church being God's house or us being God's house together is that it kind of helps us have a higher view of the church, don't you think? You know, the, how many of you have ever cringed a little bit to maybe you read an article or you, you see a Christian doing something on social media that just kind of is a little bit cringeworthy, like it's about Christians doing something, you know, and you're like, oh man, you know, why did they, why did they have that out there? That's just a little embarrassing. Why are you talking like that? That's embarrassing. And I'm not talking about like standing up for the Lord or speaking the truth, but just odd things, you know, that are done in the name of Jesus. And sometimes when those things are done, there's like that temptation, isn't there, to just have this real low view of the church. Like, oh man, they've been telling me that the church was filled with a bunch of weirdos, and now here's the confirmation. I knew it, you know, and and I'm part of this thing, you know, kind of deal. But for us, this is meant to help us say, you know, the Lord has a high view of his church. His people, like living stones, form a house that he dwells in, his temple. This is where God abides. And this should help us have a a real high view 
of the church. Uh, because, again, it's not that God waits for us to perfect the way of Christ, and then he says, now I'll dwell with you. <laughs> he just transfers us into his kingdom by the blood of Jesus, and then he dwells among his people. I think another implication of being God's house is that it should help us pursue holiness, don't you think? I mean, think about the Old Testament temple. That's what we're being compared to. In the Old Testament temple, there was all kinds of external stuff that helped people understand God is holy, and he must be approached reverently and respectfully, not flippantly. I mean, they had sacrifices, they had priests, everything they wore, every instrument they used, all of it went through an ordination ceremony. It all communicated God is holy. There's no one like God. Remember when Moses received the law for the first time? He went up onto the mountaintop and the rule was no one can even touch the mountain. They can't even go up the part of the mountain. He's just there by himself, interceding, hearing from God for the nation. So for us, it should help us understand, man, if I'm part of God's temple, if that's how God sees me, then clearly he wants me to pursue a life of holiness. I want to keep God's house clean, in other words. And then maybe one last implication of being God's house. This is real simple. The image that Peter has is of living stones being built up together into God's spiritual house. So clearly, this means that we, as Christians, are meant to, be, to, to interact together. We belong to each other. Peter doesn't have a vision of a quarry where there's all these individual rocks kind of scattered around waiting to be installed into the building. He has the image in his mind of a building that is being built. And the second someone becomes a Christian, they are put into this structure. And I don't know when God's going to finish. There will be a moment where the last person in the house comes into the building and, and the Lord returns and the scaffolding of human history falls away and we see the glorious thing that God has been building for thousands of years now. But the reality is that we're not meant to be spread out separate from each other, but we are meant to be as living stones together in the structure that God has built. We are his house together. All right, let me give you one last thing though. We've looked at the Lord making us into his people, making us into his house. Let's just briefly think about the third thing, though. He says here that we are also his priesthood. We're a priesthood of the Lord. He says in verse 5, he says, like living stones, you're being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure that you guys didn't come here this morning thinking to yourself, I'm a priest, or you're a priest. You're probably not looking at the people near you saying, yep, there's a priest over there, there's a priest over here. But the reality is, whether you wanted to be a priest or not, the Bible says if you're a Christian, you're a priest. You're in God's priesthood. Now, I know we have all kinds of modern connotations of what a priest is, but he's not drawing an allusion to Roman Catholicism or any other modern version of Christianity that has the name priest for their clergy. He's talking about the Old Testament priesthood. And the Old Testament priests, their duty was to represent God to the nation and represent the nation to God. They interceded for the nation to God, and they taught the nation about God. They made ways for people to come to God, and then they went to God on behalf of those very same people. They would offer prayers for the people to God and go back to the people to teach them what God had said. They were intermediaries, in other words, representing God to man and man to God. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you could catch a vision in your life of being God's representative, his priest here on earth. That the things that you do, the things that you say, they are meant to help people understand who God is, but also you're meant to bring people to the Lord. You're, you're to be a conduit of his grace to the world, but bringing the world to the Lord. Man, think about what this does to believers who are living exilic Christianity. You can't 
respond to the rejection of Christ with unrighteous anger when you're meant to be a priest for the very people who are rejecting the Lord. You can't flee in isolation and sequester yourselves from the rest of the world and form little Christian communes and bubbles if you're meant to be a priest for the world that you live in. And you can't conform your views to the views of society when they're anti-scriptural, anti-biblical, if your mission is to represent who God is to the world that you're living in. Otherwise, you'd not be faithfully representing him to the nations. No, an image of being a priest, a representative of God to the world that you live in and the people that are around you is such an important vision for a believer to capture in their heart. I think if you captured this in your heart, it would change your workplace. I think if you captured this in your heart, it would change your relationships. I think of fathers today. If you capture this in your heart, it changes the way that you serve your family. It changes the way that you operate as a father, knowing that you're there to try to be a conduit for your children to know who God is, to experience God, to see the truth of who God is and how he's impacted and affected your life. Would to God that we would capture a vision of being the representatives of God here on earth. You see, sometimes we talk about the new covenant, the blood of Jesus, the gospel giving us access to God. And praise the Lord, it does give us access to God, amen? Hebrews 4.13 tells us that because of Jesus, we can come boldly to God's throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. We do have access. But you'd never find a priest in Israel saying something like, you know, I know that I have access to God because I'm a priest, but I never go into the temple. I never use the access that I've been given. No, they would always feel that they had a duty before God to go to God and represent God to the people. So praise God that we have access. His access helps us execute the duty that God has entrusted into our care. And I pray that we would be incredible representatives of who the Lord is. I think our church does a pretty good job of this. You know, throughout the week, as we're going about our business throughout the week, just remembering that people are listening to what we say watching how we behave. Uh, You guys might know this in a career or job that you have, but I've got one of those professions where once people know what I do, they're watching me like crazy. You know, what's he say? How's he dress? How's he treat his family? What's he drive? People care about these kind of things, you know, almost like, yeah, why do you need to know these things? But people are watching. They want to know. People want to see how is Jesus impacted your life. Can you see that you're a priest before God to the people of this community? The other day we were down at Carmel Beach walking our dog, Max. He's this rebellious little Jack Russell Terrier. He has a mind of his own. And we like going down to that beach because he's got so much energy. So we just let him off the leash like everybody else does down there. And he just runs and runs and runs. We walk the full two and a half miles all the way out and back. And he's just running circles around us. And, you know, it's a little embarrassing at times because you just never know what he's going to do. He likes to pee on sandcastles. And, I mean, it's just you're always watching him. And the other day we were down there and he sees this little cluster of rocks off the coast. And he thinks to himself, I could just see it happening. He thinks to himself, I could go all the way out there. I could go deep out into the ocean. And I'm watching the tide come in and I call him and I'm like, Max, don't you do it. And he just books in the opposite direction and he is running. And so I've got no choice. I'm just thinking to myself, I cannot have my dog die at sea in front of my daughter. So I throw his leash down and I'm sprinting down the beach, yelling his name, Max, Max, Max. Everybody's turning around, seeing this huge dude (laughs) sprinting down the beach. And I run in there, grab him, you know, off the first little cluster of rocks and carry him back. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I know that all these people are thinking 
well, I just saw the worst dog owner in the history of dog ownership. <laughs> Clearly, this guy cannot train his dog how to behave. <laughs> and I just thought about my own life. And I thought, Lord, how many times have I behaved in a way that is not represented how good you are to me? Help me to be an accurate representative of you in the world in which I live, to be a priest unto God. So brothers and sisters, we are God's people. We are God's house, and we are God's priests. Let's live up to the calling that he's placed on our lives.